Well, good morning, First Baptist Church of Alexandria. How are you guys doing? Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate Dave's words. I'll get him that check in the mail here shortly. Um, you know, Dave is one of several connections that I have here at First Baptist Church of Alexandria. Um, one of your members, Brian Jones, is a good friend of mine. Uh, he works with North Star, and I was on the board serving at one point with him. He also arranged a contingent from your church to go to Israel. Brother Roger was there. My good friends Kim and Paul Eskridge were there. They were my bus buddies, and we had a grand old time. Okay? But probably the most significant connection that we have is that you sponsored our church, my home church, Gateway Community Church. You guys brought Ed Allen down to um, Northern Virginia, and I just want to say I am thankful for what you guys have done in bringing him, and I praise God for the investment you all have made in us. And in about a minute, you're going to see how far that investment has gone, okay? All right, well, why don't you pray with me as we uh, put this time before the Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, we can't we can't even begin to value what you have allowed for us to do, especially in light of some of our brothers and sisters across the seas whose lives are in danger for even mentioning your name. Yet you give us this opportunity each week to come together, to hear from you, to praise your name, and we do so freely. Help us never to take this for granted, Father. And we come, Lord, at this point in the service to hear from you. And wonder of wonders, Father, you use broken things and break, broken people to accomplish your will. Such is your servant today. So I ask, Lord, that nothing of me remains as you empower me to be able to speak effectively to your people for the sole purpose of bringing glory to your great name and doing good for your people. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So a few years ago, the Lord had provided me an awesome opportunity for discipleship. As you heard from Dave, discipleship is one of my passions. I had an opportunity to work for a husband and wife team, and not long into my employment with them, I began to see some things going on with them as a couple. Now, God orchestrated it so that he and I would be in the car to go uh, together to go for, to work each week, and we had an hour out and an hour back. Like Dave mentioned, when I have someone's attention for that long period of time, I'm going to get them talking to me, okay? So he was young in his faith, uh, so he was a little hesitant, but eventually was willing to share what, he was, go what was going on when I asked. Uh, bottom line, they were having marital problems, and it was pretty serious, and things were not going well. But a couple of weeks into our conversations, he tells me that she decided that she was going to move out to get some space. There's one detail that he mentioned to me that caught my attention. He said that she was taking everything she owned. So I said to him, I'm about to tell you something. It's not meant to hurt you, but it's meant to prepare you. Your wife is not coming back. Needless to say, he did not take that well. And then I explained to him some things that he can expect to happen over time. And just about everything I said happened exactly as I said it. It was like the Lord did not let any of my words fall to the ground. But what I was able to witness in the weeks and months to follow is the reason why I love discipleship. We all know that it takes two to either make or break a relationship. For his part, he was honestly trying to own his part of it. But I watched him as he extended the hand for reconciliation, even after he found out some pretty disturbing things. It was a struggle for sure, and they ultimately did get divorced. But he stepped into the struggle with the power of Christ. So why do I tell you this story? It's not because of my part in it. My part was very inco in inconsequential. God was the one that was at work. But this story teases up to answer the question of how we stand firm in the midst of struggles. Our teacher today is the Apostle Paul. We're going to focus our attention on his letter to the Philippians. So if you have your Bible, 
Our main text is going to be Philippians 4, 4 through 7. So please find your place there. But before we get there, I want you to hear what Paul says early in the letter. He says in Philippians 1, 27 to 28, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then... Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Notice Paul's understanding of the gospel of Christ. He's not just talking about the story about how we got saved. He's talking about and referring to the active power of the gospel that operates in our lives whatever our situation is. So in other words, he's explaining that Jesus did not save us to protect us from struggles. He saved us so that we would be empowered to face those struggles and gain victory. Let me say that again. Jesus did not save us to protect us from the struggles we face. He saved us so that we would be empowered to face those struggles and gain victory. Now let's turn our attention, if you will, to the main text. Just by way of background, the letter to the Philippians, I'm so, yeah, to the Philippians is just one of four prison epistles. It is important we keep this in mind. Paul is in prison, and as he writes to the Philippians, he has a perspective that is critical for un to understand why it is that he's writing what he's writing. Paul is preparing the Philippians for what he knows is coming. Now, the Philippians were the first church that Paul planted when he was in Macedonia. He enjoyed a warm and intimate relationship with them. They loved Paul, and they supported his ministry. There were no real major problems in the church, but Paul got rumblings of things that were going on, and he wanted to address them before they got out of hand. Things like infiltrators trying to make names for themselves. He heard of rumblings of division within the church, and then there was a conflict within the church. On top of that, he knew persecution was coming. And he's writing to them to address this context. Some of which of those things that I mentioned, we see today. So let's read Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. And these concluding remarks basically summarize the entire letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. So let me read this for your hearing. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There are six points that I want us to pull from this passage. And let me give them to you in order. Rejoice. Reflect, I'll explain what that means. Remember, relax, request, and then the reward. Say that again. Rejoice, reflect, remember, relax, request, and then the reward. Point number one, rejoice. Paul uses these words, uh, this word rejoice and joy about 16 times in this very short letter. Is it possible for us to be joyful or rejoice as we go through difficult and trying circumstances? The answer from Paul is an emphatic yes. Remember, he's in jail, and he's writing this letter, so, and his life hangs in the balance. He does not know whether or not he's going to be freed or if he's going to be killed. But allow me to address, I mean, to draw your attention to something he says earlier. Philippians 1, 15 through 18, he says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Look at Paul's attitude here. There were people who preached Christ out of genuine love, but there were others whose motives were wicked. 
These people preached Christ for selfish ambition, trying to make life difficult for the Apostle Paul while he was in jail. But yet his response is amazing. The motives, good or bad, didn't really matter to Paul. The motives, not the issue. What mattered was the Christ, that Christ was being um, preached. And because he was being preached, Paul could rejoice. But he goes one step further. In Philippians 2, 17 through 18, he says this. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, the Philippians had been very generous in the way in which they gave to Paul's ministry. He is saying here, though, that even if he died in the advancement of the gospel, he is both glad and can rejoice. And he also calls them to rejoice with him. So we're forced to ask one question. How in the world can Paul think this way? If you got what those verses that I quoted for you earlier, if you understood what that means, you, you can tie together what he's trying to get at. His joy was not tied to his circumstances. Paul's joy was tied to his purpose. As a follower of Christ, Paul's whole purpose was a whole purpose for being was to make Christ known through any circumstances. If you remember Paul's story, God says to him, um, God says to Ananias that God will show Paul how much he must suffer for his name. Notice how much he must suffer. There would be no way around the suffering for Paul. He had to suffer. But listen to what Paul says at the end of the first chapter, Philippians chapter 1. And he is talking to the Philippians. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. If Paul could not escape suffering, neither could the Philippians. And guess what? Neither can we. It is part and parcel of our faith. And in fact, this is the way we enter God's kingdom. If Paul's focus was on suffering, he should have run for the hills as quickly as he could. But suffering, while suffering is part of the process, is not the point. His purpose was to glorify Jesus Christ, and at any time Christ was preached, whether by Paul or a pretender, he had joy. He can rejoice even though his circumstances were not quite ideal. Now, here's a point, right? Our joy is not tied to our circumstances. It's tied to the fact that we are in the Lord and our purpose, like Paul, is to glorify him. Being in the Lord is a very important theme for Paul. In fact, it's how he starts off chapter 4. And he reminds us to stand firm in the Lord with this understanding. So let's apply that today for us, okay? I will hazard a guess that not all of us, not many of us, are suffering like Paul did when he wrote this letter. We are dealing with more basic things. Concern for a job, making ends meet, catching COVID. Is your joy affected by the change or potential changes in any of these circumstances? Well, allow me to remind you again, your purpose is far greater than any of these circumstances. You are in Christ and your joy rests in the glory of his great name. And because of that, jo- that truth, you can rejoice. Not only can you rejoice, Paul commands us to. Point number two, reflect. Now, when I use the word reflect, I'm not saying Paul wants us to think about something, like ponder it. That's not what he's talking about. The type of reflection I'm referring to is like the moon reflecting the light of the sun. So Paul wants us to exhibit a certain quality that emanates from Christ and is to be reflected into our lives. Okay? Paul encourages us to let our gentleness be known to all. What does Paul mean? We are not to insist on every right that we have and that we're entitled to, whether legally or by custom. And Paul is alluding to a couple of things here. He's talking, he's, he's building the framework for dealing with division, conflict, and eventually 
persecution. So in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, let me read this section for you because it forms the background for us to understand where Paul is going. Therefore, in verse 1, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And here's the, the, the meat behind that. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, the, to death, even the death on a cross. The Lord, the creator God, did not insist on his rights as such, but instead he humbled himself for the glory of his Father to accomplish his incredible salvation that he offers to us to, uh, as a gift. And this is the model that Paul wants us to follow. He commands us to develop a reputation of having this quality of the Lord. In all our relationships, we need to be characterized by gentleness toward believers as well as unbelievers. And in every situation, we need this characteristic to be clear. When we are in conflict and even when we are being persecuted. You remember John, as he was reflecting back on Jesus' life in his, um, his gospel, he said, the word became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Consider the woman at the well. Lepers, the blind, those who were hungry. When they encountered Jesus, they did not find someone who was demanding when the soldiers came to get him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They did not find someone who was demanding. In fact, Jesus took the time to heal the ear of a man that Peter cut off. He was gentle. He even, I'm sorry, when they encountered Jesus in any circumstance, they found one who was gentle and compassionate, showing care for them. So, this is particularly challenging for us today because if you live or reside in Fairfax County or Loudoun County, you live, or anywhere close, you live in two of the most, arguably the most affluent counties on the planet. And we like our lives, right? We have great wealth. We also have a lot of education. I have never met as many PhDs in this area that I've met in my entire life, okay? There's a lot of education here. On top of that, we are close to DC, and that's a power hub. All of these things come together and are potential danger. Why? Because it brings us to a place where we, when I say we, I mean us as believers in Jesus Christ, we can become demanding. When our lives don't go the way we want them to, we can be demanding. And Paul says we can't afford that. In fact, he commands the opposite. So being gentle must be a characteristic of, a characteristic of followers of Christ because this was what he was like. It's not, uh, it's not about us. It's about others. And therefore, Paul commands us to develop this rep reputation of being gentle. How we behave and engage people, especially in trying times, speaks volumes because it is the clearest way we reflect who Jesus Christ is. Number three, remember, Paul says the Lord is near. What does he mean by this? Why do, what do we need to remember here? He's basically reminding us that the Lord is both present and coming. The Lord is both present and coming. Paul is pointing forward to the return of Christ, but I believe he's hinting at something else as well. When he returns, we all will have to give an account for our lives, okay? 
One of the problems that today believers are facing is the issue of fear. Whether it's social unrest, political divisions, or the fear of uh, catching COVID, we have turned in on ourselves. In other words, we are starting to shift from a sacrificial service that benefits others to self-protection. But please hear what I am not saying. I am not saying to throw common sense to the wind and be cavalier, okay? Especially as it relates to COVID. We must be wise and discerning about that. What we need to be mindful of, though, is allowing caution to turn to fear because, again, fear will cause us to turn in on ourselves. It makes us think about our own welfare more than the welfare of others. And that's not Christ-like. So, has a concern for COVID caused us to stay at home and view online in lieu of face-to-face attendance? While a reasonable temporary option, it is not the traditional way of God's people, nor is it a long-term solution. Our faith is a full-contact sport and is not designed to live virtually, right? So, remember how Paul encouraged Timothy. He said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. We can face any circumstance because of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. The question is, will we live in that power? Remember, the Lord is near. While this is not a direct command, it is a strong reminder and very impactful. Number four. Relax. This is a good one. Now, when Paul says not to be anxious about anything, he's not saying that we shouldn't be concerned with anything. There are absolutely things that we need to be concerned with. But what he is saying, though, is for us not to be unduly concerned with anything. In other words, don't be so concerned as if that thing you're concerned about is all there is. Remember, we are in Christ, and nothing we face is greater than him. This truth frees us to be able to look at challenges slightly differently. So, let me give you an example. I'm sorry, looking at Luke 8, verses 22 to 25, Jesus does a wonderful thing here. So let's read. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm storm subsided and all was calm. Where's your faith? He said to the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. So here's something for you to consider. Why did Jesus ask them where their faith was as opposed to what they were afraid of. Let me ask that again. Why do you think Jesus asked them where their faith was, as opposed to what they were afraid of? So just so that you know, when Jesus asks questions, he's not really looking for answers. He knows the answers, okay? The question was designed to reorient the disciples. The question is for them, the real question is, Where are you putting your trust? Are you putting the trust in the power of the storm or in me? But when he got up, because they thought that the storm was pretty powerful, the word tells us they were in great danger. But when he got up and calmed the storm, they realized then and there that everything, even the storm, was subject to him. So, what does that mean for us? Whenever we get unduly concerned about anything, let us remember this point. We are in him, the one who commands the winds and the waves, so all things are subject to him, and because of this truth, Paul commands us to relax. Dial it back a notch. It is not that serious. Point number five, request. This last point goes hand in hand with the previous one. Because the way to keep from being anxious about anything is to talk to God about everything. Right? 
So if we ask him for what we need through prayer and we ask him, ask him for what we need through prayer and thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, that qualification is really, really important because it reminds us that no matter what the circumstances are, we got to remember we are in Christ and nothing can separate us from him. So if we begin there, then we can talk to God in the right frame of, work, uh, right frame of mind. But there's a dangerous flip side to this. Lack of thanksgiving when we're talking to God is the first step toward idolatry. This is evidence for us in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. Let me read it for you. It says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him uh, as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. We cannot properly glorify God without thanksgiving. We will either dismiss him altogether or we fool ourselves into thinking somehow he is beholden to us. So let me make this clear. God is no heavenly bellhop, nor is he a genie. He is the almighty, and we, all, we owe him our thanks. Amen? So there's no greater example, though, of this point than with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was deeply distressed by what he was about to endure on the cross, he prayed. He wanted to find another way if it were possible. He knew there was no other way. But because of the severity of what he was about to go through, it caused him great distress. So what did he do? He presented his quest to his father. Why? Because being honest with the father helped him to find the strength to do the father's will. He trusted his father to empower him to carry out his will. And in similar fashion, Paul is commanding us to follow Christ's example. We are to bring all our requests to God in prayer with thanksgiving. So, we finished five points. We're almost done. Five points. Rejoice, reflect, remember, relax, and request. If we're able to get, live in that, then there's a reward. The reward for this is the peace of God. But notice how Paul describes the peace of God. This peace transcends all understanding. First of all, this is not a formula. So if you can check these, mark, these boxes, they, that's not how this works. It's not how any of this works, right? The commands were designed to remind us of a simple truth. We are in Christ. And when you realize that, then the peace comes. So, if you can't find joy in any of your circumstances right now, you're not there yet. If you cannot relax and pray with, pray with thanksgiving, you're not there yet. Remember that the Lord is near. If you've forgotten that, you're in a bad spot. So he is both coming, I'm sorry, he's both present and coming. So somewhere in your journey, you forgot to walk in the power he has made available to you. But when you remember and you get there, oh boy. And what he says here is that God's peace will come in and guard your hearts and minds. So it's an act of God to bring the peace, not us. And Paul uses a military term, and he does it on purpose because he's acting like the peace of God is acting like a soldier or a sentry, and it stands guard protecting you. You're not doing anything. You're just being. And that's the point. It's a function, in order for us to get the peace of God, it's a function of us being, not striving. Okay? So, it is January 30th. So for those of us who have made resolutions, they all have failed. Right? Let's just be honest. We don't know what the rest of 22 is going to bring. But what we do know is that we don't need any more resolutions. What we need is resolve. We need the kind of resolve or more resolve that allows us to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let me pray for us.
Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be, be with you. I pray, Lord God, that if any of my words is not pleasing to you, strike it from the, the minds and the memories of your people. But if there is something worth for them to, to, to take and own, I pray, Lord, that you implant that in their hearts that they might live thereby. Our goal, Father, is to honor you and glorify you and make you known to the rest of the world. And if we not do that, we pray, Lord, that you, uh, you forgive us and that you empower us, break us free from what's keeping it, and that we would step out into that power and do just that, make you known to the rest of the world. We have no other reason for being here, Lord God. So as we start this week, Lord God, I ask that you empower us to do good in your name and to glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.